Ah, so, today's message is entitled, To See and Be Seen. I'll be very, very transparent. Pastor Art contacted me on Monday, said, hey, do you mind speaking on Sunday? And because anyone who has ever been in youth group under me will tell you, I constantly drill into people that a comfort zone is no place to live for a Christian. So if it's kicking you out of your comfort zone, it's probably pressing you in the right direction of where God wants you to be. So between that and the in season and out of season, the answer has to be yes when the Lord asks you to show up, right? But for someone like me, it's much easier to see than to be seen. I have a really hard time with being seen. I have no, no problem at all showing up. But it's really hard for me to be seen. Which is one of the things that I love the most about the story that I get to share about. Today we're going to talk about Zacchaeus. Most of you guys know his story. If you're like me and you grew up in church, you may have even learned the song. You guys indulge me in my little kitty song for a moment? Yes. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed him by, he looked up in that tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. Yes, I'm going to your house today. <laughs> yes, we have a few. It's always nice to not be alone, because normally when I sing things like that at home, my husband just looks at me like, you just make it up as you go along. But no, these were real. These were real. So because I learned such a simplified version of the story for so long, it was really hard for me to think a little deeper, to dig a little deeper. But there is nothing about God's word that's ever elementary, ever. So I'd encourage you to open your ears, open your spirit, and hear the story of Zacchaeus from a fresh perspective today. So if you would turn to Luke 19, verse 1 through 10, I'll be reading from ESV, as some call it the especially spiritual version. And it's simply entitled, Jesus and Zacchaeus. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. One of my all-time favorite movies is Vantage Point. Has anyone else seen the movie? Okay, There's, again, it's always nice to be in good company. I know it's not the most popular movie, so. Um, just to kind of give a little bit of background about the movie, basically you are literally watching the same scene over and over and over through the entire movie. And it's an assassination, so you're watching, but first you're seeing it from right here. Then you're seeing it from over here. Then you're seeing it from all the way up here. So when you first see it, you're like, bam, I know what happened, I know exactly what's going on. But then you see this side of it and you're like, wait, 
I think I was off the first time, but I, I definitely got it now. And then you see it from up here, and it's like, oh no, wait, 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 I was wrong before, but I've definitely got this now. And I think that's kind of where we live. We see things from this vantage point and sometimes we forget to see it from this one. Yeah. So I want to cover first, as any good English student would, the who, what, where, when, and why of Zacchaeus' story from our perspective, from the earthly perspective. So who? Zacchaeus, a rich tax collector, AKA a thief and a cheat who oversaw thieves and cheats. What? A man trying to see Jesus as he passed by. Where? A sycamore tree in Jericho. When? As Jesus was walking through Jericho. Why? Because he was small in stature, a large crowd, and he wanted to see who Jesus was. So in my Bible app, I typed in tax collector. Just wanted to see. And what I found is that very often, near tax collector, it says, and sinners. But the tax collectors were sinners, so why the differentiation? And I think it has a lot to do with the society. The society saw the title, the society saw the sin, the society saw the corruption, and they put them in a special breed of sinners. They set them apart. Well, at least, you know, I'm just a sinner, but at least I'm not a tax collector. <laughs> that sounds crazy, right? But what was their response when Jesus was going to Zacchaeus' house? They grumbled, and they said, he's gone in to eat and be with a sinner. For a sinner to make that statement is pretty bold. But we do it often. True or false? I also believe that because the word is God's word, God wrote tax collectors and sinners for a reason. Because he didn't just see the title. Because he saw the person. And he understood that because society saw them this way, they had to be loved differently. They had to be met differently. So there is differentiation because each of us have different needs. But God always sees from his perfect vantage point exactly what our need is so that he can meet it. So I just want to warn us to be careful. Be careful when we look and we see what we think we know about someone. Let's be mindful that no one and nothing is far from God, far from his heart, or unable to be redeemed by his grace, by his love, by his peace, by his joy, just as we all once were. Amen? So why couldn't Zacchaeus see Jesus? Well, they said it's because he was short. Have any of you guys ever been to like a really crowded show and there's just like no hope for those of us who are vertically challenged? <laughs> Right, and the struggle is real because you're, you're like tiptoeing or if you're like me sitting on pillows just trying to get a little bit of an edge. But sometimes there's that nice person who says, oh, I see you can't see. Why don't you just come right on up here? You know, short people up front. No one did that for Zacchaeus. Why? Because it was a large crowd full of people who were offended by his existence. So there's a good possibility that Zacchaeus was either a social leper, where they just didn't want to acknowledge him, or he was literally just invisible because no one wanted to see him. And I would encourage you never to let anyone in your view be invisible. Don't let them be held back by the title. Don't let them be held back by whatever they're engaging in. Encourage them to come up front so that they can see and be seen. Amen. Amen. <sighs> he literally climbed a tree. Not figuratively, not like, oh, it would be a really good idea if maybe I could. He ran away from where the crowd was, where Jesus was, to fix his vantage point. He climbed up a tree. And I've wondered, 
Why a sycamore tree? Why is that relevant? There are so many different types of trees. Why did the Lord feel that it was relevant to put a sycamore tree specifically in here? So I googled. And this is known as Zacchaeus's sycamore tree. You can see the, the gentleman standing over there. It doesn't look all that huge. Right, so I, I wondered at first, like, okay, well, is it the height of the tree? Is that why it makes it so important? I don't, I don't think it was that. I think it's because sycamore trees are covered by a canopy of leaves. It would have been really, really, really easy for Jesus to miss him. Really, really, really easy because you think about it. Jesus wasn't walking like on a red carpet where there were um, like guidelines and columns to keep people back. Jesus was walking in a crowd of people, surrounded and encompassed with people who don't really respect personal boundaries or personal space. At what point, honestly, okay, so I'm an introvert, right? And I don't like crowds. I don't do well. I don't function in that environment. Maybe I'm biased, but I think Jesus was an introvert. Um, I have reasons for it. If you want to know, we can talk about that later. Um, but I fully believe that Jesus was an introvert. And here he was walking with crowds pressing in all around him. At no point for me would that cue to me, look up, look into the trees and see what you have. At no point. But Jesus already knew. Jesus already knew what his mission was for the day, and he knew that Zacchaeus was part of that mission. And he knew exactly where to look to find the man who was hidden in the crowd, ran from the crowd, climbed up in a tree, and more than likely covered by leaves. He looked up, and he saw him. And not only did he see him, he didn't wait for Zacchaeus to say, oh Jesus, hey look, here I am. Instead, he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house today. I must go to your house today. He didn't wait for the invitation. He invited himself to say, here I am. I'm going to love you up close and personal whether you asked for it or not. I'm showing up because you wanted to see me, so here I am. And it's just me and you. No crowds, no noise, no opinions, just me and you. Man, what that must have been like for the tax collector, the rich man, the chief thief, to know that Jesus was coming to his house. It says that he received him joyfully but I'm sure behind all that joyful, there was probably still a little like, eh, but my house is not clean. I didn't get to prepare. I didn't get to make it all nice and pretty. But none of that was relevant because the one who he wanted to see saw him. And he chose to invite himself and he chose to love him up close and personal. And I think about yesterday, right? We went to the mall. It's kind of our Saturday ritual. We go to the mall, we get Chick-fil-A, we hang out, we let Bella run around in Disney Junior, try to burn some of that energy. So I'm standing out with the stroller. Arabella's inside with her dad and all these other kids. And she's watching me. And I'm like, go play. Like, you've got all this stuff. Go run, go play, have fun. And she's just watching me. And she slowly walks over to the edge in between two full-grown adults that she did not know. And she simply reached her hand out to me. So I reached back and I touched her hand because I thought maybe she just, you know, maybe she just wants to be reminded mommy's still here. So I touched her hand and she began to gently tug on me to try to pull me in. And I was like, no, baby, it's okay. Go play. Go play. Boppy's there. Go play with Boppy. And I immediately turned around and started crying. Why was I crying? One, because I'm, in, I'm an emotional wreck. It's just what it is. But two, because my child met me where I was and reached out a hand to draw me into her joy. 
If that doesn't speak, we walk with the joy of the Lord every single day. We have that privilege in a world that is so broken and shattered. And it's so hard to even just watch the news because you know you're going to walk away distressed and discouraged. But we have the opportunity to reach out our hand and draw someone into our joy and bring them into the relationship that we know has redemption, has peace, has freedom from all of the, the stuff, the nonsense that has just overwhelmed and bogged them down for so long. If only they would not be afraid to step away, to grab the hand, to pull themselves up, to climb the tree, to be seen. But it's so much easier to hide. It's much easier for me to stand on the outside of the play area and really know that it's fine for my little girl to forget all about me. But she didn't. She wanted to bring me into her joy. And that is how we need to live. We need to live with a deep passion to draw people into the joy that we have. It was never meant for just us. A few weeks ago, I was driving home from a doctor's appointment. And it was a little far because I was really, really sick that day and my doctor wasn't working in the office that's five minutes from me. She was working in the office that was 35 minutes from me. But when you're sick, you do what you gotta do. On my way home, I'm driving on the parkway. I had him on speakerphone, my husband on speakerphone. And I'm like, you know, I just really want to get home because traffic is getting rough, rush hour. And then I hear a sound. And then I start to smell the burning rubber. And I'm like, I think my tire just blew. He's like, are you okay? Are you okay? I, I think the tire just blew. Give me a second. Let me pull over. I, I think I was in like the third furthest lane from the shoulder. Began to drift my way on over on what was indeed a completely ruptured tire. It, it burst in about four different areas. It was a complete mess. And God carried my car across all the lanes of traffic, allowed me to park right on the shoulder safely. At the same time, I watched another car follow me in front of me, but they followed as well cut across all the lanes, and they stopped. And I'm like, well, this is awkward. I'm in the car by myself. This just doesn't feel safe. But Lord, I'm going to just lock the doors and trust. That's that. And they sat. And they sat some more. Then they threw their car in reverse. Hmm. Again, this is awkward. Because I can't go anywhere. My tire is literally in shambles. What is happening? And then I look up and I see in their rear view mirror, they're going like this, asking me if I'm okay. A perfect stranger took time out of their day in the middle of rush hour traffic to pull over to sit with the girl who was in the car by herself just to make sure I was okay. I don't know who that person was. I didn't get a license plate number, nothing. I just gave the thumbs up right back. They said okay, and they went on about their day. We should be that person. We should be that person willing to pull the car over, to stop everything, to make sure Someone else is okay before we continue on our merry little way. And again, I, I get it. That's scary to do in today's world. It's scary. But here's the reality. If I trust that God holds my life in his hands, then I trust that if he, if he prompts me to do something, then he is going to cover me through it. And even if he doesn't, it is well with my soul. Amen. Even till death, it is well with my soul. Because with death comes life. 
right? Those who lose their life will surely gain it. So if I give my life, and I mean that I give my life, then I should be able to walk fearlessly into whatever valley, into whatever darkness, and know that my light outshines what's around me. And where I walk, light should be brought so that I can see the need and I can meet the need. And the need will always lead me back to leading them to Christ. Because I've got nothing to give. I literally have absolutely nothing to give. Nothing. And do you know how perfectly that positions me to be used for the kingdom? <sighs> Isn't God awesome? How he chooses the unlikely. How he chose Zacchaeus, the unlikely tax collector, to make relevant. To make his point known. I love that it actually says in here in verse 9, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham, not he's becoming a son of Abraham. God saw who he always was, even though no one else did. God knew his identity. And I really think that's where we need to live. We engage the Holy Spirit so that we can be so connected that when it comes time to engage the enemy, we know that our victory is assured and we're not afraid to engage our community because we know that it's ultimately God's will that will be done. So now I want to just take a look at the who, what, where, and why from Christ's perspective, from God's vantage point. Who? I love this. The name Zacchaeus means pure and clean. So where everyone else saw the rich tax collector, the, cheat, the thief and cheat, who oversaw the thieves and cheats, Christ saw Zacchaeus pure and clean. What? A lost man in need of a savior. Where? In the mission field. It just so happened to be a sycamore tree. But it could have just as easily been the workplace. It could have just been, you know, a Dunkin' Donuts. It could be anywhere. Simply in the mission field. When? In perfect timing. Because timing really is everything. If I try to draw someone before God has called their heart, I put myself in a bad spot. But if I wait on the prompting of the Spirit and I respond immediately to his prompting instead of asking for 34 signs and wonders that say that I should be obedient, <laughs> real talk. If I'm obedient in the moment, then his perfect will will play out in his perfect timing. Amen. And why? because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What is our why? Because God so loved the world. Because God so loved the world, not just the church. God loved the world. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. If you'd like to turn there, please feel free. If not, I got you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Make disciples of all nations, not just the ones we're comfortable with. Can I have someone, anyone, to just hand these out? Thank you. And what these are, are just little reminders. 
You put them where you may, keep them where you may. But they're leaves. Because where was Zacchaeus? He was hidden amongst the leaves. And each leaf has a mark on it to remind you to look beyond the leaf, to see the need and meet the need. We can't see the sin and not the sinner. If we're truly trying to be Christ-like, we cannot stare at a label or behavior and not see the person. We can't look at the sin and not see the brokenness. We can't look at the need and focus on our own reputation. We cannot see the pain and not feel the desire to heal. If we are truly being Christ-like, Christ didn't care about his reputation. He didn't, because if he cared about his reputation, he would have been very careful to hang out with the Pharisees who, who were just, you know, playing the part anyway. But instead, he chose to be with those who were authentically in their pain, in their struggle, knew exactly who they were, knew exactly what they were doing, and it didn't matter to him that it looked a certain way to anyone else. What mattered to him was seeing those who were left unseen. We're called to be heaven's ambassadors. An ambassador is an authorized representative or messenger. An authorized representative or messenger. We should be living as heaven's recruiters. So let's snatch people out of hell, one relationship at a time. Amen. 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 I want to share with you guys just real quick the devotional that I've been doing, um, the one from this morning. First of all, it's a great devotional on the Bible app called The Politically Incorrect Jesus. Right up my alley. This one is entitled Parable of the Fertilizer. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16, Jesus describes his followers as salt and light. Like salt, they'd be a preservative in society. As light, they'd illuminate the beauty of the presence of God to dispel the darkness that blinds us to all that is good in the world. When I was a kid, my family lived in a small North Jersey town, not far from New York City. Being Italian, we had a very large garden. Every spring, a large amount of fertilizer was delivered to help us prepare the soil for planting. It had quite an aroma, as you could imagine but it was effective when used properly. Now, I'm taking liberty with what Jesus said and adding another trait of Christ followers persona. We are to be like fertilizer, along with salt and light. We are meant to spread throughout the land and nourish the environment so that things can grow and be fruitful. Today, our culture needs more than just preserving. It needs replenishing. Ideally, we as Christians should be known by the way we enrich the world by our presence. But take that same fertilizer and store it for too long, and it begins to fester and smell. It's not a pleasant aroma when that happens. Instead of contributing to the overall productivity of the soil, it becomes useless. So ask yourself the question, am I preserving the land? Or do you remain in the salt shaker, clumped together with the rest of the salt? You know what happens then. The longer it stays in that shaker, the harder it is to shake loose. Is your light pleasant to be around, or is it blinding? Just what are you illuminating anyway? And finally, are you acting like fertilizer, spreading out to enrich the land, or stockpiling yourself with other believers? I would encourage you, really, to press in. Every morning when you get up, simply ask the Lord to let you see from his vantage point so that you can see beyond the leaves, beyond the coverings, see the need so that you can press in and you can reach out that hand that says, let me bring you to the place I know. Let me bring you to the man that I know, to the one who loved you first. This week's challenge 
It's simple. Have dinner with someone you usually wouldn't. And I don't mean, I mean, Pastor Art didn't say all this, but I'm putting forth the challenge on his behalf, so I'm going to add my own little touch to it. I don't mean someone like, oh, because of our schedules, we normally don't get together. I mean someone who you would initially look at and go, ah, really, Lord, are you sure? <laughs> it's a challenge for a reason. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be fruitful. So, like I said, press in. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask the Lord to put a name in your spirit now from now and I'm also going to pray that he doesn't relent that he presses you until you walk in full obedience if you don't want to get on board with that prayer don't say amen but that's between you and Jesus uh, so Father God I thank you so much I thank you that you look beyond the leaves I thank you that you see us in the sycamore tree I thank you, Father, that you see what you have called us, not what the world has said that we are, not even what our actions and behaviors have said that we are. So I ask, Lord, that we would see with the eyes of Christ. I ask, Father, that we would have your vantage point to see those who you have called sons of Abraham and that we would be prompted to meet that need. As we go forth in this challenge, Lord God, I ask even now that you would drop in our spirit who it is that you have destined for us to have dinner with for such a time as this, for your work, for your will, and for your purpose. And I ask, Lord, that you would be relentless in dropping this in our spirit until we walk in fullness of obedience. So, Lord, I just, I'm so grateful for the perfect example that you are. And I simply ask that you would have your way, that you would seal this word. In Jesus' name, amen.